Well, hey everybody, how are you doing? Still hanging in there? <laughs> we'll get through this one of these days. They'll start to open things up and um, we'll find a new normal. But for now, we just continue to do what we're doing. Oh, and thank you for um, the feedback that you gave me about last week um, when I went to the church and shared with you pictures from the inside of the church. And also want to thank Nancy Munn again for her beautiful, beautiful offering. I, and I know from the feedback I got that you were all really touched by it. So I was excited about that. And I was thinking of this week, okay, what can I do this week? So um, I met someone at the church, uh, Juan Carlos Gonzalez, JC, who is one of our choir interns. And um, he brought his guitar and sang beautifully. And so that'll be this week's surprise offering. Now don't forget to stay tuned for the message after this, but here's JC. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior Wasn't that great? 
He's so talented. But today's message um, is we're going to talk about uh, doubt and faith and fear and uh, and probably all feelings that we've been feeling in the in these present times of such uncertainty without throughout the whole world. But the our gospel passage today picks up where the uh, disciples have gone back in fear and they're hiding in fear. You might say they were uh, sheltered in or they were hunkered down in fear that the um, authorities that had all, had arrested Jesus and, and you know been behind his crucifixion that they would be coming for them next. You, you remember this in the translation it says they were fearing the Jews but we must be very, very, very careful that that actually that word is Judeans. And I wish that they wouldn't translate it like that in the English translations because it has been um, justification for a lot of anti-Semitic attitudes and actions and words that have just really been destructive. And so what they're talking about, these were people that were from Judea. And we have to remember also that when the gospels were written that the, these new followers of Jesus that recognized him to be the Messiah, they, they were from Judea, they were, they were Judeans, and they were part of the, the faith of the people. And they were trying to figure out a way to reconcile um, both their heritage and this new direction that Christ was taking them. And so anytime there's um, something new coming and something breaking apart, breaking open, there's always going to be those struggles and, um, and a lot of the language that we'll see in the Gospels. It's, it's, it's rhetoric that's meant to be um, apologetic in the sense that they're trying to, to convince. And so there's always a danger when we're trying to convince with words, but, but words are important and, and we need them. So uh, we're grateful for those words that are written in scripture, but it's just important in the 21st century to, to be clear about what's being said and what's not being said. So what they were afraid of were these authorities that had been behind the death of Jesus. And so they're huddled up there in fear. So Jesus appears to them and the first thing he says to them is peace be with you. And don't you know that was just like a soothing balm to the disciples that um, that their leader, their teacher, the one that they had um, loved so dearly and followed so um, with such great commitment, and they were had been grieving him for his death, and then there had been such confusion with the empty tomb that now he appeared before them, and much like Mary last week, they may have wished that he was coming back to make everything the same, but he didn't. In fact, he appeared to them, he showed them his wounds, and immediately he starts talking to them about that he's gonna send them out the same way that his father, God, had sent him to them. And he breathes into this them this empowerment, his very presence. Um, the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, right there in the midst of their fear, in the midst of their uncertainty, um, not only does he come to them and reassure them, but he says, you got, you can't stay here. You can't hide in here. You've got to get out and be about the business, the business of being Christ in the world. So it's natural that then they would want to tell um, Thomas, who apparently was the only disciple that wasn't hiding in that room. And I would love to know where he was and what he was doing, uh, that he wasn't in that room with them. But for whatever reason, he wasn't. And so they went and told him what had happened. Now, Thomas uh, gets a bad rap, I think, because we labeled him Doubting Thomas. And, um, you know, I think that all of us would probably have that same reaction, uh, at least on some level, because I mean, what they were sharing with him was pretty incredible news. And so he says to them, unless I can touch, uh, not to see, but touch. And remember, Jesus had showed them, didn't say whether they, they touched him or not, but um, Thomas wants to have some concrete reassurance and proof um, that this is all really true and it's really happening. And you know, sometimes things seem too good to be true. And I'm, I, I'm imagining that he felt that way. So a whole nother week 
goes by. And then Jesus appears to them again. And again, they're, in, they're closed off together. Only Thomas is with them this time. Again, Jesus enters in with peace be with you. Uh, probably sensing that they need to be told this over and over and over again, just like we do. In the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of being uncomfortable, our, our fears, um, out of control, we need to be reminded that peace comes to us in the midst of all the other stuff, um, not in place of it. So he says, um, you know, okay, Thomas, take a look, go ahead, touch. And what I think is interesting is that it doesn't say that Thomas did touch him. Immediately, Thomas just, that light goes on and he, he claims, oh my God, my God. And that um, the language in there, then um, the larger, the whole, that he was recognizing that he was part and committed to um, the larger whole, which is Christ this something that's bigger than him, something that he's a part of, that he belongs to. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out is when, um, some, you know, sometimes the English translations, they kind of flatten out things and we don't get the nuances. So um, when Jesus says, in a lot of the translations that we read, it says, Jesus says, um, do not doubt, but believe. But that word that gets translated into doubt is really more of a uh, do not become an unbeliever. Like, don't let this thing, um, don't let this ruin our relationship. Don't let this um, make you give up hope. Don't make this thing um, cause you, cause everything to be undone that you've built up so far. But there's no chastisement for going through the process of doubt. And sometimes um, the true path towards a faith that will last, and they would need a faith that would last because they would go through hardships and persecution and, and rejection and, um, and death. And they needed to have the kind of faith that could persevere and endure through all the trials to which they'd be called. And the same goes for us too, that um, it's really important that we have the kind of faith that can endure. And sometimes the way to get to that path of faith is through the process of struggling with doubt. And we don't like it, it's not comfortable, but if we're really honest with ourselves, um, we probably all have had times where we were in the middle of something or we experienced a trauma or someone we loved to experience a trauma and we think, well, where is God in this? Uh, I mean, how, how could God let this happen? Um, is this really, uh, is this true? You know, like what am I doing? What am I giving my life to? Um, I've got a, a little example and it's not, it's not anything traumatic, but it was a time in my life that I could recognize kind of as I was going through it and, and on the other side for sure, where doubt was my companion that broke me open. When I was, um, getting ready to go to seminary. And when I was getting ready to go, one of the um, elder pastors in the church um, cautioned me. He said, don't let them, don't let them change your faith. Don't, don't, don't let any of this change what you believe, uh, change your faith at all. So I took that very seriously. I was in my fifties at the time. And so I felt pretty, uh, pretty Staunchly in my ways and what I believed and and I thought it was kind of an odd caution actually but taking it seriously I would literally drive to Austin without really knowing it with my hands clenched on the steering wheel um, with the idea that I'm not gonna let this nothing's really gonna get to me I'm just gonna get through this and initially I resisted a lot of um, a lot of the things that I was hearing and and experiencing. I remember the first day we had chapel and the president of the seminary said, um, this is what's gonna happen. Uh, while you're here, we're gonna shake everything that you ever knew about your faith out of you. And then we're gonna be here for you while you put it all together. Well, that terrified me. 
and I also felt a, a little pride and stubbornness rise up in me, like, not me. Maybe these young kids, but not me. And so that's kind of how I approached things that first semester. And slowly but surely, I began to open up my mind. But it took a little bit longer for my heart. And I will say that during that time, um, I went through a real period of, of doubt. Um, I didn't really doubt God, but I doubted what I had always thought to be, you know, concretely true. I doubted what I was learning. I doubted my own ability to judge the difference between the two. And slowly but surely, I broke open and began to be comfortable with the disruption. And um, with the fact that I got to a point where I really didn't know what I believed about some things. And I remember the last day of class, I was walking across this bridge to my apartment and just this peace came over me. And I remember thinking that the seminary experience hadn't been about credentials or degrees at all. It had been really about saving me from certainty. The certainty of thinking that I had to be right in order to serve, or I had to be certain of everything in scripture or everything in the doctrine, that, that really the life of faith is much more fluid than that, and that God's love is much more expansive than that. And that my uncertainty and even my doubt could be useful in strengthening my faith. Now, not everybody likes that. People like to be certain about things and not everybody likes someone who is comfortable with uncertainty or nuance or, um, you know, just not knowing for sure. And so when I got back, it made some people uncomfortable because some things I had been, had thought one way about, I now thought another way about. And um, so that's the one thing I would would say about that, that as we break open, that, that sometimes it makes others feel uncomfortable. And maybe that's what happened with Thomas, with the, the first group of disciples, that this, they were broken open in this moment with Jesus, and, and he wasn't, and so it made him uncomfortable. And he had to have his own disruptive moment before he could be broken open too. I've heard it said that, you know, we all are raised with a certain kind of order and structure because we need that. Um, our egos need that to grow up and survive and learn how to be in the world. But that in the faith journey that there usually comes a time and most likely in adulthood when, when you do have a disruption, something happens, a death in your family, uh, a life event, a world event like this pandemic, that something that disrupts everything that you knew before, you know, all the rules that you thought were set in place and set in stone, um, you can't apply them now. That nothing's making sense. And it's a very uncomfortable place. But then um, as we surrender to that and move into it and trust the process, which that's what the word faith really means. We, uh, and belief, the, the Greek word for belief and faith are the same, um, on the same thread, that it's not a head thing. It's not a matter of just getting in your head and your intelligence what you think is right, but it's, it's what will you commit your life to? What will you trust to be there through all the disruption? I believe this is what Jesus was trying to get across to the disciples and especially to Thomas. And when he said, uh, happy are those or blessed are those that, that will believe without seeing, um, that's where we come in. <laughs> uh, because we don't have the privilege or the opportunity that the first disciples have. But here's what we do have. We do have, we have the scriptures, we have our trad traditions, and we have each other. And we've all been empowered by that spirit of love that calls us to be that in the world. And so when we find ourselves in this time of pandemic and this time of uncertainty, and, and actually this time, I think as much as the, the virus, that there is this pandemic of distrust. We really don't know who to trust, what information to trust, and 
there's a lot of manipulation and um, there's a lot of untrustworthiness at play right now too. So it's important that we stay, stay connected with the stories, um, the stories of God's intervention, God's provision, God's protection, God's salvation, um, God's mercy, and God's grace. And that we remember that, that through that same love that we're empowered today to continue to be trustworthy in our own lives and continue to, to trust that no matter what we go through and no matter how things get shaken up and, and maybe how differently a new normal will be, that, that we have that same opportunity to work through our doubts as Thomas did and to come through them with the blessing of knowing that, um, that God's love is everlasting and that he'll never let us go. So this week, as uh, we continue to learn what it, what it means, what it's gonna look like for um, the authorities and the experts and all that to determine what the next step will be and, and what opening up the country will look like, um, there's probably gonna be some more disruption and some more uncertainty, but, but give yourself a break if you find yourself feeling doubt and um, give yourself encouragement in that through that process, your faith can be strengthened. May you remember also that you were created in love by the Creator God, and that in Christ you've been lovingly redeemed. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can continue to wrestle and to endure and to carry on. God bless you and go in peace. And I've got one more little surprise for you. Um, JC sang another song that I asked him to sing, and it's the Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah. I think that it is um, in some ways such a, a beautiful expression of what the journey of faith is. It's, um, it's not always a victory march, right? And often it can be a broken hallelujah, but that hallelujah endures. Hey. I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do ya? And it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah.
It doesn't 